North Penn High School, a concept first presented in the 1950s to the North Penn Valley. After much conversation and debate, as a community, the North Penn residents decided that it could better serve the needs of the students in the towns of Hatfield, Lansdale, North Wales, and the surrounding areas by one high school. In 1955, North Penn High School officially opened its doors with an expanded facility at the Lansdale High School location on Penn Street. However, within just a decade, economic growth and a growing population, this high school on Penn Street no longer had the space or the resources needed for our students to compete in our changing society. The space race was on. Technology, math, science, and a growing local economy combined with another population burst, the North Penn community rallied behind the need for a new, modern facility to meet the demands for students who could excel in this new age of technology and science. As the first men were landing on the moon in July of 1969, ground was broken for the new North Penn High School all the way out in the farmlands of Toa Menson. By 1971, construction was complete on a state-of-the-art facility where students could study, learn, and excel in all areas of our modern economy. This building, North Penn High School, continues to serve students from the first graduating class in 1972 to today. While an addition was added in 1999 to accommodate growing enrollment in the 1990s from a population of 2,400 students to nearly 3,000 students in the high school today, the original structure has not been renovated for over 52 years. This new North Penn High School in Tomenson has served this community well for over 50 years. Like many of us, its age is showing, and it's just not the 70s inspired paint palette. It is the critical components that people do not see in the walls, ceilings, and mechanical closets. The HVAC system utilizes the same pneumatic technology from the 1960 Apollo era. Valves and plumbing have continued to corrode and expresses itself frequently with burst pipes that create significant damage in the building. Electrical components, lighting, structure, windows, and roofing are all in need of help. Our North Penn Facilities Department has tended to this building well over the past 50 years, plugging, patching, and repairing where possible. Even the spaces themselves require an update to bring North Penn High School into the 21st century, meeting the needs of students for the next 50 years. When first opened, North Penn High School included spaces for meeting, collaboration, discussion, and innovation. Those spaces have been gobbled up by the need for additional instructional spaces and programs that were never part of a 1971 curriculum. Nearly 50,000 graduates from North Penn High School have gone into the world well prepared for an ever-changing society. Our staff and community have always been committed to our students to achieve that goal. North Penn is again ready to meet the challenges of a new century, the needs of our diverse student body, and the expectations of a community that is, and always has been, North Penn strong. Assistant Superintendent, and I'm so happy to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Um, we are really excited that you chose to join us. It is a beautiful night, um, and I'm sure there's other things you could be doing, but I'm glad that you also realize how important it is to be here tonight to hear the two options that the team up here will be presenting for your feedback. Um, I'm going to be turning it over very soon to two gentlemen who will kick this off, but just want to share that tonight is really to give you the information on the two different options that we will be presenting. We will have an opportunity to answer some of your questions. We've also compiled some frequently asked questions that have already come in. So different than a school board meeting where you have an opportunity to maybe speak and give your thoughts and opinions for three minutes, that's not tonight, but we will have uh, microphones available this evening in the event that you do have a question about what's presented. So again, thank you so much for joining joining us tonight. We are really happy that you're here, and I'm excited to now turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Todd Bauer, and our chief financial officer, Mr. Steve Skoraki. Thank you, Dr. Waters, and good evening again, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and for everyone who's tuned in online, thank you. Uh, it's a very important evening for us here in North Penn, and we're excited to share these options just to give a little bit more detail. Uh, to what Dr. Waters said, we are planning on 30 minutes or so of presentation and then about an hour of question and answer. 
Uh, we sent out the information after the March 13th work session with a link to submit questions. We've compiled those questions and kind of aggregated them. Uh, we will answer some of the most frequently asked questions, but we will also take questions live from Facebook, from YouTube, from email. We created an email address for this tonight, and then from the audience as well. We have a couple folks with microphones. And so with that, we are, are going to get started. So this slide here is not uh, to something that I'll go over in great detail, but it, the point is to emphasize that we are not ultimately just making a decision about North Penn High School, right? So everyone knows, and it has been well documented since about 2017-18, that we've had conversations about renovating North Penn High School and moving ninth grade to that campus. But if you move ninth grade to the high school campus, you now have three middle schools that have grades seven and eight in them. Are three middle schools still necessary? Do we move sixth grade out of the elementary schools? What's going to happen with our transportation depot, which is also on the high school campus, and adds significant traffic to that campus and that area? Um, the ESC is in dire need of repair. We also have many buildings in the school district that have modular units. So there are a lot of things that go into play when it comes to master planning for the North Penn School District. However, the first decision that needs to be made and the most pressing decision that needs to be made is what are we doing at North Penn High School? And this is something we've been discussing now for the better part of five years. We're actually looking at some footage and you may see some later um, when we had a similar opportunity in 2018 and Dr. Dietrich and I are both sitting here and I don't have gray hair. Uh, things have changed. We've been talking about this for a long time, um, but now we are finally on the precipice of renovating North Penn High School. And I do want to emphasize that we, the administration, are recommending that we move forward with one of the two options being presented this evening. Um, inaction is not an option. That building is in dire need of renovation and repair. work session. That was a 90-minute presentation that will go into greater detail than everything that we present tonight. The focus of tonight is to give an overview and then an hour of Q&A. But if you have not watched that meeting or you didn't attend the March 13th work session, I encourage you to check it out. One of the highlights was the rationale behind bringing ninth grade to our North Penn High School campus. And um, there's a reason why 98% of the high schools in the country have ninth grade at their high school. There's a reason why we are the only school district in Montgomery County that does not have ninth grade on their high school campus. And pretty soon we will be the only school district in Bucks or Montgomery County who do not have ninth grade on their high school campus. As it currently sits, 130 of our ninth graders who are distributed across our three middle schools go to our high school each day for classes. That's 13% of the kids get on a bus start their school day earlier than their classmates in the middle school and take classes at the high school. There are also another 130 students who go to North Monco. So that's 260 kids who get on a bus from our middle schools and get transported over to the campus at North Penn High School for academic reasons. That does not include the students who come over for athletics, for band, for other extracurricular activities. So 26% of our kids already come over. Our kids in ninth grade miss out on opportunities for higher level courses because they are not offered in our middle schools. They miss out on opportunities for North Monco, and I'll show you some data to support that in a moment. Our JROTC program is only offered at our high school. Our engineering academy is only offered at the high school. And lastly, our internship program in the community. These are just some of the, the things that we offer at North Penn High School that we don't to our ninth graders. And in any other high school, they would be available because the ninth graders are on that campus. So this is data from a survey given to all ninth graders last spring. And you will notice that 13% of our students reported that they come up to the high school, ninth graders, for courses. Another 64% said they would have if those courses were offered in their school. So that means our students are not taking the most rigorous course of study or courses that they want to take because they don't want to be bothered by getting on a bus, being separated from their friends, and coming up to North Penn High School. 
Um, so these statistics, quite frankly, to me, are alarming. That 64% of our kids said, there are classes there that I would have taken, uh, but I didn't because I didn't want to get on a bus and be separated from my friends. So we're going to talk a lot about 21st century buildings and schools. And when we use that vernacular, 21st century schools, I think it's important to kind of talk through what that means. And I'm going to do so this evening just by offering some research, some data, and some quotes uh, from some literature on modern schools and buildings. But when we talk 21st century schools, we're talking about accessibility for all kids to all areas of our building. The way our building is currently constructed, and again, it was built in 1971, ADA was not even a thought. So we have areas of our building that are not accessible to some of our students with disabilities. So a 21st century school is accessible to all students everywhere. Um, it, it includes aspects of academic performance, increased student achievement, student well-being. There's lots of research that dictates that certain components of the facility itself helps students' mental health, stress levels, and anxiety levels. Um, it inspires innovation and creativity. It inspires kids and teachers to collaborate beyond the classroom. Uh, it increases engagement and creates a sense of belonging, a sense of pride, inspiration, and trust. So some of these images that you'll see now on your screen are images that were presented in March. These, most of them are images from Upper Marion High School, which we went to visit recently, and that was, we live streamed that trip. We took a bus full of folks from North Penn High School. We did a tour at our school, and then we went to Upper Marion. Upper Marion's facility was designed by Schrader Group, who is also our architect for this project. But we talked about small group and teaming spaces. What you see here is flexibility, where kids can go out of their classroom to work together and learn together. There are spaces there that students can sign out to use with large monitors to collaborate on projects and team. You see a quote here on the screen in front of you that says, when students feel supported and have a sense of belonging, excuse me, a sense of belonging and have opportunities to engage in activities, they have increased well-being as well as better completion and academic outcomes. This right here is a learning stair. It's a three-story space connecting the levels of their academic wing where students can take classes they have teachers teaching during the day in these spaces. Students who have classes in these adjacent classrooms that you see on the perimeter here of this image, when they are said, OK, get to work, they can go out onto the learning stairs, work together. They have cross-curricular opportunities with teachers across the hall. Currently in our building, our hallways are eight and a half, nine feet wide. There's not space for things like this to occur. And you'll see in this quote that children need safe, well-designed well places to learn. And research has shown that the right school setting can boost students' achievement. This is the view from the other direction, looking down those same stairs. A school that supports mental health is culturally responsive to the students and community where the school is located. It's responsive to the natural systems where it's located. It really takes advantage of natural ventilation and sunlight, but also provides big windows so students, teachers, and staff can see trees and gardens. This is just a traditional classroom. The classrooms, in my opinion, when you tour Upper Marion, are a bit smaller than what you may expect because of these additional spaces because the lecture is occurring inside the classroom, but then the learning co collaboration and problem solving spill out into the hallway and into these common spaces. A study that examined records from three school districts in the United States and over 2,000 classrooms during an academic year found that students in classrooms with the most daylight advanced 20% faster on math tests, 26% faster on reading tests. Our current windows in North Penn High School are about six inches wide and do not open. Um, and each classroom has one window. So this is a space in the STEM area of their building. So you're, you're noticing a garage door there on the left. And the classroom space where students are building, constructing, and working. But then there are the learning stairs and large group instruction spaces just outside in the hallway. Um, there are also, if, if this was a panoramic and you could, were able to look even more left, there are garage doors to a courtyard that open up to the fresh air, secure spaces. 
Um, but this quote here says that non-traditional school environments and student-centered pedagogies lead to higher levels of student engagement, collaboration, and connection than traditional classrooms. Additionally, students in these flexible environments produce higher academic achievements than their peers in traditional settings. Again, so you're, you're going to continue to see just spaces that look dramatically different than what you would see in North Penn High School. And you'll read here that the school environment is so often ignored in terms of how it makes students and teachers and the community feel. For the last 40 years, they've really been designed to look like and feel like prisons, often by the same architects that design the prisons. We need to start rethinking them as places to help students and teachers and the community flourish instead of a place as a place of control. This is a lab space. You'll notice this is a lab space, not a class and lab space. Um, we noticed as we toured a variety of high schools you know, across kind of the northeast, we went as far down as Virginia to tour high schools. You often saw like a classroom space and then a lab space, and they shared the lab space between the two classrooms. Flexible learning spaces embrace student activity and movement, which align with shifting away from the traditional desk and chair layout. Classrooms that include more collaborative spaces, more places to work, and fewer desks enable greater student engagement and focus. And lastly, we hit on, in, on March 13th, the common space. No longer are schools designed with simply a cafeteria, but rather a multi-purpose space known as a common area or a dining commons. Um, uh, areas and spaces that are utilized by the community in the evenings for large group meetings, performances, um, and there's really an area of the building that can be shut down, that is the academic space, whereas there's a more communal space that is operational sometimes in the morning and the evening for the full community. So lastly, we're almost done with the quotes here. Students spend the majority of their time in school. Those environments have an outsized impact on our lives, but they also shape how we think about ourselves and the world. There are a lot of messages that we give to students with the schools that we design. Design can teach students and give them hope that we care about them and the planet and that they're inheriting from us. So it's really important at a bigger picture to think about schools and school districts because they're spread across communities, across counties, as places where you can really make an impact on public health, equity, and climate resistance. And this is just from the other direction here. The ability for school staff to monitor common areas can help to facilitate school climate and give autonomy and ownership to spaces, to students, excuse me. Just as the built environment for the classroom is important for the ability to teach, the design of the common areas of the school facility facilitate relationships and interactions between peers that teachers and school staff can support. This is just a view of a food court as opposed to assembly line or cattle chutes for a cafeteria. Here's a gymnasium with an indoor track, multi-purpose space. Buildings and grounds used within and outside of school hours contribute to student well-being, increased physical and mental health, positive relationships, and increased access to student services. Performing arts, this is an auditorium. In this auditorium, I don't know if you can see, but there are actually three sections up there. So uh, I don't think I have an actual pointer here. But in the middle of the screen, in the balcony, um, there's a large uh, wall that comes out and can separate the balcony. There's also a divider that can block off uh, the top of the auditorium to create more classroom spaces. Here's a band space, and you'll notice that this band space and music space is ADA accessible. It is not at North Penn High School. Students in wheelchairs cannot access that space. And lastly, this is just another example of large spaces. Uh, these are the lockers at Upper Marion. That's it for their entire high school because students really don't use lockers at this point. Our students at North Penn High School, we have 3,000 students, and I believe it's about 400 students who utilize a locker. Um, so th they're able to open up hallways and give more space because there's not 3,000 lockers. OK, so now we're going to talk about uh, the two options. And first, we're going to start with our existing site. So the existing site is, uh, most of you are familiar, this is North Penn High School. In the front there, you have K-Pod. 
In the back, you have Crawford Stadium, back left. Top right is the WMPV property, with the, which the school district currently owns. We do not utilize that property right now, but we do own that property. You'll also notice a transportation depot uh, that is in between Crawford Stadium and the WMPV property. And in both of these options, we are proposing that transportation would move off of the campus. Discussion about the future of North Penn High School has been a topic since the late 1990s. After the addition of K-Pod 24 years ago, the 1971 edition has been patched, stitched, and held together by a dedicated and talented facility staff. As the clear need to fix both the original 1971 building as well as the 24-year-old 1999 edition, it is time to reimagine what North Penn High School should look like and how it should function in the future. Since 2019, the high school and long-term facilities plan has been discussed at community forums, school board meetings, superintendent community conversations, and sessions with students, just to name a few. Spaces, but Jamie's a teacher here at North Penn High School. Our Jamie. bus to North Penn High School's reimagined future allowed participants in person and online to see elements of what a reimagined North Penn High School design could include. A value added thing that's really coming through for you. Because right now we have to determine All underground. Where's it going to go and what's the benefit going to be? Yeah. And w have you found anything specific? The, the biggest thing are these collaboration spaces to give kids other places to work that learning anywhere, anytime learning stuff is what really is, is hit people, teachers and students as the most valuable part. Our tour guides showcased how the building was designed for student success, incorporating all the modern elements of a sustainable, energy efficient, safe and secure building to meet the needs of today and tomorrow built in 1968, right? Let's say they moved in brand new, wood paneling everywhere, green, orange cabinets and countertops, yellow tile floors. So few of those people have a house that still looks like that. Right. That's like North Penn High School. A modern high school design provides not only innovative teaching methods, but also the latest technology and security and energy efficiency. I was amazed with how open it was. It was something like the open layout was just so, it seemed so inviting. The first thing I definitely noticed was the amount of windows and the lighting, which I feel like that was like a universal response. Got a little jealous, I can definitely say that. It really reminded me of like a small college campus, you know, because obviously I'm a senior, I've taken those college tours. You walk right in and there's all these places to just sit down, do work, and I think that that's something that every school needs. I think students would be more motivated to actually come to school, especially since we just sit in our classrooms for eight periods a day. It was a very, very welcoming environment, definitely. The sunlight flooding in was super, super nice. It was a welcome change of pace from North Penn. I think one of my favorite parts about this school is that in K-Pod, you know, obviously it's like the newest edition and there are those huge windows and it just, it makes, it just opens up the room. It makes it more comforting, you know, rather than our, the tiny little prison windows that I can barely look out of that just make it seem like I'm so much more boxed in than I actually am. Students could rent out that one room and work there for schoolwork and their teachers could still see them. I think those type of concepts would be helpful at North Penn. And I think having those areas that are actually designated to collaboration will help have a better school environment here. It wasn't just that there were these like areas to study like outside of the classroom, but like they were close to the classroom. So it was like basically right outside, you know, and it would be so much more efficient if we got in groups and like, like we do in classroom, yeah, it gets noisy. And so even today I was asking my teacher, I, I was um, talking to my friends and I was like, do you guys like, wanna go in the hallway? And of course, you know, whole entire school is really hot, so wouldn't have helped anyway. So we didn't, but it's also cause like we would be sitting on the ground and like, there's really nowhere to go and even even though it's still like outside in the hallway there's it's still these walls and it's there's not no open spaces being able to move around and collaborate in spaces outside of the four squares that we're in now i think it would help so much with people grasping what they're learning i think it definitely emphasizes that the school cares about the student, like each student's individual needs. And when you provide that flexibility for each student to choose 
how they want to learn, how they want to sit. I think the students feel like the learning is more accessible. I didn't realize how desensitized I was to the like closed in walls and uh, tight corners and everything until um, coming back to the building after seeing Upper Marion and how open things could be. It just, it, it felt more relaxing to be there and less, um, not that this place feels stressful, but it's, it's very crammed and it feels small even though it's huge. You know, fixing and reimagining are completely different things. Fixing is, you know, talking about this is broken, air conditioning, heating, whatever. I mean, ours has probably been broken forever. Let's fix it. But then reimagining, and I think people get scared of that because it's a bigger project. And obviously what we're trying to do, what, the, what everyone's trying to do here is like take a whole 360 on the high school. You can't put a fresh coat of paint over 1970s architecture and expect it to be modern because of the fresh coat of paint. I think going to the school really put into perspective how much North Penn is lacking. And obviously, a lot of students here are very grateful for the opportunities we have, but when it comes to basic things like heating and cooling, and again, like the leaky windows and how isolated we, are, we all are in our classrooms, um, I think that the improvements need to go beyond just like our basic needs. A modern high school design provides not only innovative teaching methods, but also the latest technology in security and energy efficiency. By incorporating these tools, students can have access to personalized learning experiences that suit their learning style. Investment in North Penn High School will need to accommodate enrollment growth, provide safe, secure, and healthy learning environments for all students, and upgrade aging facilities and infrastructure to increase opportunities for students to grow and learn in our ever-changing global society. This has been the journey we have been on to reimagine North Penn High School. And these are now the decisions that we will make together as the North Penn community. I need a little help with the slide. Thank you. Okay, um, so we went into greater detail on March 13th, but an overview here of what was discussed are two options. And I want to again reiterate that it is the administration's recommendation that we go with one of the two. Um, option one is, uh, if you would call it um, the all-in. Option one would bring ninth grade to the North Penn High School campus and reimagine our spaces. Um, see some of the concepts, not all, and it wouldn't look exactly like or have everything that you see at Upper Marion. It would have what we want with design concepts that you see and saw in some of the schools that we visited during our tours. Uh, the price for that is listed down below as $400,801,431. Now, option two is the basic renovation and systems upgrades that would not move ninth grade to the high school campus. And that price tag is $236,325,945. It is important to note that with option two and not moving ninth grade to the high school campus would necessitate all three middle schools also being renovated in the long term. I certainly recognize we are not making that decision right now. I certainly recognize that that would be eight years from now or, or longer, depending on what the board decides, what, who knows if I'll be here in 10 years. I certainly hope so, but that is far off into the future. But option one has a price tag of 400 million. Option two has a price tag of 236 million, but option two would require all three middle schools to be renovated. Other implications of these two options, I think I kind of outlined these. Um, option one would offer us some flexibility to move forward with just two middle schools. If we decided the next building on our kind of timeline of renovation would be Pendale Middle School. So if we decided to move forward with just Penbrook, Penfield, for example, 
Um, that would offer the flexibility with option one. Option two uh, would require modular construction on the campus, and I will explain that in greater detail here. So option one, and I want to emphasize the fact that this is a concept, not a design, but what you see represented in this picture is essentially the real estate or structures required to house ninth grade, okay, in terms of size. Not necessarily where or what it would look like, but how much space would be represented in this picture to house ninth grade. So we received a lot of questions that were, we're saying, why couldn't ninth grade be here? Why wouldn't ninth grade look like that? That has not been designed yet. We do not have a contract to design North Penn High School with ninth grade there. But this is just a concept of what it could look like. You will notice uh, at the top of this image, or in the back of the building, transportation is not there. There's additional parking, which maybe we could separate student and staff parking with that larger parking lot in the back. We would then have uh, handicap accessible parking for Crawford Stadium. Um, and we would have all purpose fields, whether they're for athletics, activities, band, whatever. But there are proposed fields in the back. You'll also notice that we're proposing that we would have fields where the WMPV property is. Because certainly with more students, we would require more spaces for activities. Option two. The only thing in red is addition, and that would be to expand the space where the arts are and our music classrooms are, um, because we would need to make them ADA accessible, which they currently are not. So there's a small sliver there that's in red. That would be an addition. Everything else would be renovated. Um, a systems renovation, new floors, new ceilings, new systems, new paint. Uh, but you're also seeing highlighted in yellow at the rear of the building the structure for 24 modular classrooms. So in option one, we would do the addition first. The addition would be utilized as swing space for moving students and teachers out of areas of the building so we could renovate those areas, right? So if we're talking about APOD, for example, we would close APOD, use the addition for those classrooms, renovate APOD, and then move those folks out, then move to BPOD. So we would use the addition to help us renovate. In this option two here, we would have to bring in modulars those modulars are estimated to cost $15 million. And now Mr. Scrocky will give a brief overview of budgeting. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, thanks so much for attending tonight. We really appreciate you being here. And for those that are viewing online, the same thing. I'm going to cover three items tonight. First, I'm going to talk about a little more detail with respect to the budget estimates. I'm going to talk about what it looks like for a potential taxpayer impact for each of the two options, and finally provide a little detail about the referendum process. So the first thing I'd like to cover is to talk about some of the budget estimates that we developed along with our architect, the Schrader Group, to determine how the numbers for both of the options were determined. Uh, the first thing to mention is that the cost increases were assumed to be 4% each year. That was part of the cost escalation. Even though in the recent years, in particular the past two, three years, the construction costs have greatly exceeded that 4% number. But the 4% is what we use to develop the estimates that you're going to see tonight. Also, there's two types of construction costs that we'll show, two separate line items, if you will. Uh, one are called the regular construction costs or hard costs. These include all costs related to the building and site construction. So these would be your primary contractors, your primary trades, your general contractor, your electrical contractor, your plumbing contractor, and your HVAC contractor, and your site contractor. Contrast that with what are called soft costs. Soft costs include design fees, permitting fees, legal fees, contingencies, furniture, fixtures, technology, equipment, other professional services. And as was mentioned by Dr. Bauer, both options, option one and two, anticipate the acquisition of a new site for transportation. So you'll see the cost estimates broken down for moving transportation under each of the two options. And that does allow greater flexibility for the high school campus by moving transportation off of that site. Okay, both options do include a comprehensive renovation of North Penn High School, of the existing structure. 
Option one also represents $20 million worth of conversion of interior spaces at the high school to provide that next generation learning spaces or 21st century learning. And Dr. Bauer just mentioned too about option two with the modulars, $15 million, that is a heck of a lot of money for temporary classrooms that would be removed at the end of the project. They would not remain, they would be removed to allow for that swing space during construction. And finally, the option two estimates basically took the 2018 facility study that was conducted and escalated those costs to the present day. So let's get into a little more of the detail now between the two options. And I do want to mention that there's a lot of additional information, a lot of spreadsheet work that goes behind these numbers here. Uh, cost per square foot and so forth, probably beyond the scope of tonight's meeting. But we do have a monthly facilities and operations committee meeting, and our plan is to have a standing agenda item on the facilities and operations committee where we can dive into some of more of these details whether it's at facilities and operations headed by Mr. Schneider to my right or at the finance committee meeting, those are probably two opportunities to provide more detail with some of this information. But option one, again, would be the next generation learning spaces, 21st century learning, new, high, new ninth grade center, and then complete renovations to the current high school. The total budget for that, the estimate is $400.8 million dollars. The total budget for option two is $236.3 million. So to provide more detail between the hard cost construction costs and the soft costs under option one, we'll start with the first item. That's the ninth grade new construction. The hard costs are $75.7 million, soft costs $18.9 million. So the total in the green column on the far right, first row is $94.6 million. And we're gonna come back to that number because that is the number that will be uh, considered for the possible referendum vote, $94.6 million. The high school addition and renovation for the remainder of the high school, $248.4 million for the construction cost, $40 million for the soft cost, the total cost, $288.397 million. Now, the transportation center costs, they're the same between option one and two. Construction costs between the hard cost and soft costs for transportation center is $14.7 million, and the estimated acquisition cost for a new transportation site is $3 million. So again, out of that $400.8 million, $338.9 million comes from actual construction cost or land acquisition. 61.88 million comes from soft costs. In a similar fashion for option two, the breakdown here between hard costs, construction costs, and the soft costs, so it's $179 million for the renovation and addition at the high school. Soft costs represent 39.558 million giving us a total cost of $218.56 million. And again, transportation would be the same as it was with option one, giving a total on the bottom right, total escalated cost of $236.32 million. So now before we get into discussion, discussing what the potential taxpayer impact is, it's important to delineate and provide a little lesson, so to speak, between the difference between assess the value of a property an implied market value, okay? So we're gonna give a little review of what that means because many times people tend to think of their home and they think of what the market value of the home is, but you are not necessarily taxed on what the market value is. You're taxed on what the assessed value of your property is. And that assessed value, that number shows up on your tax bill each year. You get a tax bill in the spring from your, your county and municipal government. You get a tax bill in July from the school district. On that bill shows the tax the assessed value, and that is really the basis for the amount of your taxes that you pay. So contrast that with a term called implied market value. Implied market value is the theoretical value of a property. It's not the actual market value. The, the actual market value of your property is only determined when you sell the property. Uh, a transaction, an arm's length transaction that's reached between you and a potential buyer, that really determines the market value. And that's based on a number of factors, condition of the home, location, size of the home, and so forth. But implied market value is calculated from the assessed value. 
You might be thinking, why am I talking about this? You're going to see in a moment when I show a chart, because we're going to be able to do a crosswalk between the assessed value and the implied market value. So how do we get to that implied market value? You take the assessed value of your property, again, that shows in your tax bill, and you divide that number by 0.3953. So what is that 0.3953 number? Well, that's called the common level ratio, or the CLR. That is a number that's unique to Montgomery County. Each of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania have a common level ratio. That's a number provided by the state. They take a look at market data, transactions of properties in Montgomery County, and that number is derived from that. It's supposed to represent a ratio between the assessed value of your property and the market value of your property. The last time a countywide reassessment was done here in Montgomery County was sometime around 1997. So the farther away you go from a reassessment, the greater the difference between your assessed value and your implied market value. But the mathematical calculation, which we'll show in the next chart, is simply the assessed value divided by 0.3953 equals the implied market value. And that common level ratio number changes each year. And it typically goes down each year. As market value goes up, as sales prices go up, the common level ratio goes down. OK, so if we take $150,000 assessed property in North Penn School District, that represents the median value of a homestead in North Penn School District, okay? So the median value of a residential property somebody uses as their primary residence. If we take that $150,000 figure, divide that by the common level ratio, that gives an implied market value of $379,459. Again, that might not be your precise market value based on the location and other factors, but that's the implied, that's the calculated market value for your home. So now let's take a look what the estimated homeowner impact would be at varying levels of assessed value and then looking at what the calculated implied market value would be for that property. So let's start in the middle column, if we could, please. That's the assessed value of $150,000. Again, that represents the median assessed value. So for option number one, with the total estimated budget of $400.8 million, that's a property with an implied market value of $379,000. The cumulative, and I want to stress that word cumulative, that's not a one-year increase. That's the total increase over 32 years. That's how long it will take to pay back all the bonds that would be issued for the project. The total increase to pay off the debt for this project would be $7,165. That's the total cumulative increase over 32 years. Now, the increase from year to year, it varies from year to year. Some years there's no increases, some years there's a smaller increase, some years there's a larger increase. But that is the cumulative total increase under option one. So the figure on the left column, $300,000, if your property is assessed at $300,000, your implied market value is somewhere around $758,917. Your cumulative impact for the financing of the option one, $400.8 million, would be $14,330. And again, I want to stress, it's the cumulative impact, and it is for the debt for this project only. Now, that doesn't mean that will be your only increase over time, because there's general operating expenses that the school district needs to budget for and pay for. This is for the portion of the debt relative to option one for the high school project. And the far right column, if your home is assessed at $100,000, your implied market value is $252,972. Your cumulative impact over that 32-year period is $4,777. Okay, so let's look at option two now. The assessed values are the same as what we just presented. The implied market value calculation is exactly the same. But the total project costs are different, of course. Here we have $236.3 million under option two for the total project cost. The cumulative taxpayer impact is less, of course. It stands a reason since the project is substantially less. The assessed value of $150,000, that taxpayer would pay a cumulative increase over the 32 years of $2,015. 
A $300,000 assessed value property would pay a little over $4,000, and the $100,000 property would pay $1,343. So now let's compare the difference between option one and two. As Dr. Bauer has mentioned a few times now, the administrative recommendation does not include an option three. It's option one or option two. So when you frame it from that perspective, we wanted to compare the difference between option one or two. If the school board follows the administrative recommendation, one of the two options is going to happen. So if we take the center column again, the $150,000 assessed value, option one, the cumulative increase over 32 years would be $7,165,000 for this project. Option two was $2,015. So again, if we go with one of the two options, it will either be 2015 or 7,165. The difference between the two is $5,150. So one perspective or one way of looking at the difference would be option one is going to cost an additional $5,150 compared to option two. And on an annual basis, that $5,150 over 30 Two years amounts to an additional $161,000 for that median assessed residential property in North Penn School you District. You said thousand. One sixty-one. One sixty-one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> $161 annually. Yes. Too many thousands in my mind. $161 annually on average. Thank you for that correction. You're welcome. Quite important. I just, well, at least one person is paying attention in the audience, right? Okay, so no, no, $300,000 assessed value scenario, the difference between the two options is $10,301. That's an annual average difference of $322. And under the third scenario we have here of the assessed value, third scenario of assessed value of $100,000, the difference over the 32 years is $3,434 or an annual average of $107. Okay. Okay, so we talked about the possibility of a referendum in the previous discussion. Talked about it last March in a little more detail than we're going to talk about tonight, but I just want to talk about the referendum process a little bit, what a referendum means, and we are only talking about a referendum for option one. And why is that? Because the $400 million if the referendum would be approved, allows flexibility to incorporate that debt in our general fund budget. We do not have the capacity in our general fund budget to pay for the $400.8 million. Legally, we have enough capacity to borrow $400.8 million, but from a budgetary standpoint, we've done extensive financial modeling with our financial consultants, 30 plus years of financial modeling, we don't have the capacity in our general fund budget with our Act I limitations. Act I is an annual cap with respect to a tax increase. We don't have the budgetary capacity to absorb $400.8 million in debt, hence the need for a referendum under Option 1. Under, under Option 2, $236 million, we do have the budgetary capacity to handle that debt without a referendum. So I've said many times, in my view, the referendum is the ultimate form of democracy because every registered voter in North Penn School District can vote yes or no on the referendum question, which I'll show in a moment. You need one more yes vote than no vote for the referendum to pass. It's as simple as that. Majority wins of those individuals that vote on that day. Now, in terms of the process, uh, the board would need to conclude the electoral debt is advisable for option one. Uh, a resolution would need to be adopted in advance of the election and actually specify the ballot question. That would need to occur probably sometime in October or November based on our timeline that we're looking at. And the reality is the referendum, if it would be conducted via a special election, which would mean it would be its own separate date, the special election better syncs up with our timeline with doing some preliminary schematic design work over the next several months. In all likelihood, if we do proceed with a referendum, it most likely will be in January, January of 2024. And I believe that Tuesday in January, it was January 16th, is the potential date that we were looking for. Okay. 
Okay, so the board resolution would probably need to occur sometime in October, November, because advance notice needs to be provided to the Montgomery and Bucks County Board of Election. Uh, if you didn't know, we have about 75 parcels that are located in Bucks County. So North Penn School District is not just located in Montgomery County. We do have a sliver in Bucks County. So the special election referendum question would need to be in both counties. So in terms of what the referendum question would actually look like, there's very little flexibility we have with respect to the ballot question. You can't go into detail explaining the project. Uh, it's really as straightforward as what's on the screen now. You know, insert the dollar amount, insert the project, that's about it. That's required under the law. There's really not much deviations. So with our current estimate for the ninth grade edition, the referendum question would go like this. Shall debt in the total sum of 94 million $640,440 for the purpose of financing the construction of a new ninth grade addition at North Penn High School be authorized to be incurred as debt approved by the electors? Yes or no? That's it. That's the question. Now, can there be supplemental material uh, at each precinct for voters to review? That's actually going to be at the discretion of the Board of Election. That's something that we'll have to work with them if we proceed in this direction. Okay, and I, I do encourage you to take a look back at the March meeting for more detail about referendum, but we will also continue to talk about the referendum process both at the Facilities and Operations Committee meeting and at future Finance Committee meetings. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Okay, so at this point we're going to, and we are a bit over here, uh, we are about 20 minutes longer than we thought at this point, including the videos, um, but we are going to field some frequently asked questions that were submitted online. We're going to go to the audience, Ms. Liberoski here, who is monitoring social media and Facebook and YouTube, and we'll also have some microphones in the audience. Uh, Mr. Nicholson and Dr. McKenna will walk around and we'll just ask if you have a question. When Dr. Water says, anybody in the audience, raise your hand. They'll come around. Uh, you'll state your name. Um, and if you care to, just say, my name's Todd Bauer and I have children at Oak Park Elementary School and blank, or I'm a retired citizen in the community. And then ask your question. And we hope to field questions. We're going to go beyond 7.30 if uh, the questions keep coming in. But we'll try to cut by 7.45. So Dr. Waters, time is yours. Thank you. All right. So as Dr. Bauer said, we do have some frequently asked questions that have already come in. We're going to start there. And the first one is, is there an option to build the ninth grade addition and just make necessary renovations to the high school? Dr. Bauer? Yeah, so this was probably the, the most common question that was submitted online, some, uh, you know, rendition of it. And the answer to this question is yes. However, we cannot do anything beyond option two without passing the referendum. So we need to, the first step is for us to proceed with the referendum process, have our community decide yes or no, do we want to move ninth grade to the high school campus? And if the answer is yes, then we start to design and actually have renderings and detail on what North Penn High School will look like. I feel confident in saying that figure that you see for option one is all in if we completely reimagine the full building, but I interpret this question as saying, is there something in between the two? And ultimately the answer to that question is yes. However, they would both require a referendum. So we need to do that first and then design the high school and we would go from there. All right, thank you. And speaking of referendum, it sounded like the entire project could have been completed within the existing limits of the Local Government Un Unit Debt Act. So why was the direction to go for the referendum? And I think you know who I'm going to turn to for this one. Dr. Bauer, first I'd like to mention that you can tell, I, I got the Andy Reid reference there about times yours, so I can tell you're an Eagles fan. I don't know if anybody else picked up on that. <laughs> so at the March meeting, we talked about what the school district's debt limit is. A school district in Pennsylvania is governed by the Debt Act, and school districts cannot borrow just an unlimited amount of money. So I talked at the March meeting about what the limit is for North Penn School District. There's a calculation. It's called a borrowing base, and then you can take 225% of the borrowing base. Long story short, at North Penn, our debt limit is roughly $556 million total. Right now, we have outstanding debt totaling $65 million. 
so we actually, I, I said this wrong now. So we have $621 million is our capacity. We have $65 million in outstanding debt, leaving us with a total capacity of $556 million. So our total capacity is $566 million additional dollars that we could borrow. So clearly, under either option one or two, legally we have enough capacity to borrow the money. However, as I mentioned earlier during the presentation, we don't have the capacity from a budgetary standpoint to absorb $400 million in our general fund budget based on the modeling that we've done over a 32-year period, hence the need for the referendum. The referendum allows the school district to incur debt, incur that debt that could be used to potentially raise taxes in excess of the Act I cap. Okay, so any referendum debt that would be approved by the voters would allow the flexibility to raise taxes higher than the Act 1 index. You can keep your mic on, uh, Mr. Skaraki. If the difference between the two options is more than just a ninth grade addition, why is that the only portion proposed to be part of a referendum? I think the first important point to, to keep in mind that a referendum, even though it's for the ninth grade edition, it really is a referendum on the entire option one. Because if the referendum fails, option one fails. So when we were looking at our uh, budgetary projections and our analysis, the high school edition, the ninth grade edition of roughly $95 million, it was basically that portion that was needed to be carved out of the total project cost for the referendum to have that outside of the Act One limit to make the project work. So it happened to sync up that $95 million via referendum, also allow some additional flexibility down the road for potential middle school projects as well. Uh, but let it be very, very clear that the referendum, although it's just for the $95 million, the way we're anticipating it, it really at the end of the day is for the entire option one, even though financially it's just for the $95 million piece. Okay, hey, thank you. All right, the next question. The cost of Upper Marion High School was reported as 110 million for 345,000 square feet. Please help me understand how this project to renovate and add on is substantially more money. What is the existing square footage of North Penn High School and the proposed additional square footage for option one? And we're gonna hear some new voices. I'm gonna turn that one to Mr. Schneider and Mr. Schrader, please. Thank you, Dr. Waters. Uh, to start out, I will provide you the information. The, the existing North Penn High School is approximately 550,000 square feet. And we are looking uh, adding additional square footage to the North Penn High School. Um, the reported value of the Upper Marion High School at 110 million reflected the construction cost only, the hard cost. It did not reflect the soft cost. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Schrader, who was the architect on Upper Marion, and can explain the difference in the, the costs and fees. Good. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. So it's interesting. You heard quite a few numbers at the beginning of this pertaining to building costs, site costs, and soft costs. And so the Upper Marion project, while reported at $110 million in building construction cost, had a $20 million site package. So now you're at just under $130 million. And it had another 20 million of total soft costs. So the total value of that project was $150 million. So interestingly, as we've been going through the programming process for both a ninth grade center and any additional spaces that might be required for the 10 to 12 portion of this, you're looking at 800 to 850,000 feet, which is two and a half times the, val the size of the Upper Marion project overall. Um, quick math of 150 million times two and a half would get you to 375 million dollars. So the numbers equate if you start to look at the square footage. The last thing that you have to add in there is escalation from a project that was bid in 2019 to a project that has to be escalated to the midpoint of construction. And this project would be escalated to somewhere in the time frame of 2026 or 2027. So if you do all of that math, the numbers actually correlate right on. Okay, thank you. 
All right, the next question that came in says, this will be a beautiful space, and I agree, I got to tour, it's amazing. Um, but if we don't keep class sizes down, it could go to waste. So what steps are we taking to keep class, class sizes small as we plan this exciting renovation? Dr. Bauer? Yeah, so currently, are there exceptions or outliers in terms of class size? Certainly. Um, we do have some courses that have st 30 students in them, let's say a PE class. Um, but on average, a class at North Penn High School is about 24 students. Um, but some specialty classes actually are far below that simply because of facility limitations. So for example, uh, when we went on our tour, we went into some of the art rooms in JPOD. We are limited in some of our art rooms with only 18 seats because the space just doesn't allow it. With pottery wheels, um, if you go to FCS classrooms, you have stoves and kitchens and utilities and appliances. Um, and we just don't have the space. So our class sizes are actually pretty solid at North Penn High School. One thing I think is worth noting is, and I think this will make sense to most people, I know most of you don't have experience scheduling a high school uh, with this many students, but if you have your ninth graders, your thousand ninth graders, and all of their teachers spread across three facilities, three buildings, Penfield, Pembroke, and Pendale, and then you bring them all to the same place, and have all the teachers and all the kids in the same space, you obviously can be more efficient because you're on one location. So your sections can be more balanced. You won't have one section of Algebra 2, let's say, that has 28 kids and another section that has 14 uh, because you have uh, more options to go across the board for all 1,000 kids. And of course, the associated teachers. We're projecting about 100 staff members would go to that campus. So I actually think it would help with class size as opposed to hinder. All right, thank you. And the last question that came in a few times is about security. So will there be any changes or updates to security or security protocols with the ninth graders being in the same building, which will now create a structure housing 4,000 plus? Dr. Bauer? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably need to lean on uh, Mr. Schrader for the security question as well. But I do think it's important uh, to note that obviously Upper Marion subscribed in a large part to a security through transparency philosophy in many of their structures and spaces where you can see everything. You can see everyone. There's no nooks and crannies, but rather it's very transparent. There's also spaces that were uh, easily shut down. You hit a panic button in a certain area of the building and Garage doors or uh, uh, solid structures fall down. Every single door and every single space is on a swipe card with limited access to certain adults as opposed to uh, North Penn High School, we have keys and lots of them. Um, so there are, there are structures in place right now in current technology that are far beyond what we currently have. Um, but keep in mind, we don't, there's, there's a lot of glass at Upper Marion, absolutely. Do we need to have all of that? Do all of our spaces need to look exactly like that? No, that depends on the design phase and the priorities of this community and this board. Um, and when we engage stakeholders in the design process, all those things are considered. Um, so there are many things from a hardware and structural and architectural standpoint that can make a building safe. But we also know that there are some other things that can make a building safe as well. Your supports for students, your mental health supports, um, and your educational programming. So many things that uh, contribute to student safety, but certainly some things can be taken into consideration during the planning and design. Mr. Schrader, anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is we have been uh, researching schools for approximately 30 years now and have seen them all across the United States. Um, the Upper Marion Area High School is paralleling a lot of what we're seeing in terms of trends, and yes, it is transparent. Uh, that goes a long way in some ways, and obviously some folks have a concern that it goes uh, the wrong direction as well in some cases. So anecdotally from the buildings that we toured like it across the United States, the story that we heard over and over again was to provide not just the opportunity to hide and not just the opportunity to control space, but also give the opportunity to flee. And so if you look at all of those opportunities, that's where all of these building administrators and all the security personnel in each of those districts thought buildings should head as well. So those, along with all of the technology that are built into these buildings that Dr. Bauer just talked about, give all of us the opportunity to really control a building a little bit better. 
Okay, thank you. So if those were some of the questions you were wondering about, hopefully we've answered some things you're thinking about as you listen to tonight's really informative, detailed presentation. However, if you are still wondering, now is the time to answer the questions you may still have. So I have my friends in the back, Dr. McKenna, Mr. Nicholson, they have microphones. They're gonna hold on to them, but they will be coming around. If you have a question, just wave your hand um, and we will come and get that question for you. Okay, I see one in the back, thank you. Go PSA, town medicine resident and uh, North Penn High School graduate. Um, I think Mr. Scrocky mentioned that there wasn't a countywide reassessment since 97. Um, is there any scenario where we have a reassessment and say the office spaces are assessed at a much less value and we can't actually finish this project? Uh, I think the probability of a countywide reassessment in Montgomery over the next five years is pretty low. So I think that's unlikely. Uh, with respect, though, to assessments of commercial spaces, one thing North Penn School District does on an annual basis. We do take a look at sales activity in our community, and if it's determined that there is an inequity, meaning that a, a property is under-assessed based on a recent sale activity, we, do, we as a school district do file assessment appeals against properties challenging those assessments with the goal to get the assessment correct for the property. Because for every property that is under-assessed, a property that is correctly assessed is paying an undue share. Mr. Crocky, what is the threshold for that? The threshold is uh, $500,000 difference in assessed value. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions from this side? All right, I see one. Thank you. Dr. McKenna? Hello, my name is Dan. I have a daughter at Gwinnett Square. The price tag you guys have seems like a ballpark estimate. What's the give and take? Plus or minus 10%, 20%, Maybe Mr. Schrader would be the best person for that. I mean, it all depends on the design, of course, and where we take it. I think a, the option one is a ceiling. I guess we could have all kinds of facilities and turf fields everywhere, inside and outside, and, and it could be well beyond, but that's not what we are looking at. Um, but what is typically the flexibility through the design phase, Mr. Schrader? Well, I think the percentages that were just quoted are, are probably somewhat accurate in that uh, it could fluctuate, it probably will fluctuate as you go through the next year. The goal from this point until the end of this year would be to really create some kind of design out of the square footage, take that design and let a number of estimators put real numbers to those beyond what's been shown so far, and hopefully to come out the other end very similar to the numbers that have been presented this evening. So could there be an over and under? I think there could be. I think what the district is looking to do is to try to control those numbers to some extent, which could mean scope up, scope down, uh, whatever it takes to keep these numbers close to where they are. Thank you for that question. Um, we do have some people watching from home. So Ms. Liberowski, anything coming in live from Facebook or YouTube or any of our other channels? Uh, yeah, we are getting a few questions. Here's another one related to property value. Um, if we don't know the answer, maybe we can find this one out. Uh, what is the estimate of possible property value increase because of having a desirable schools? And are there home sales data for districts who have built new schools um, versus not? Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. I don't have any kind of empirical data or studies to, to indicate that. I'll make a general statement about home values in North Penn School District and sales activity in general, uh, but we'll have to find out the specific research. But one of the things, there's been a phenomenon here in North Penn School District, in particular in the past three years, the, the sales activity of both residential and commercial properties in North Penn School District is just off the charts the past couple of years. Uh, last year, in fact, our realty transfer tax revenue that we receive anytime a property sells was at an all-time high and is very strong again this year. So sales are very robust. Clearly there is a, a big demand for properties in North Penn School District. And to a large extent, that can be, I believe, in my opinion, can be attributed to the quality of the school district. Uh, but I can't cite a specific study or cite a specific percentage here. We'll have to see if we can find that data. But thank you for that question. That's a great question. Okay, let's go back to our audience. Mr. Nicholson. 
Hi, um, I'm Andrea Lesher. I have a child at AM Culp in sixth grade. So my question is more logistics. Um, I'm sold on the project. So assuming we go with option one, what is the, and I know it's hard to determine right now what exactly is going to happen with our kids going through the project while they're going through middle school and high school. But I'm mostly interested to know the impact to our kids while the project is going on and they're going through high school at that time. So I can kick it off and then pass it to those who are more involved in facilities. So you're, you're correct. There would be substantial disruption on the campus itself. Um, so if we point to a far smaller scale project, Knapp Elementary recently, um, th there was disruption, right? So classes are moving um, in the middle of the day because of sounds of construction, et cetera. That said, their addition was, I believe, four classrooms. Um, this would be a facility, an addition, that can house roughly 1,000 students. So the space that we will use as a swing space is proportionally a third of what we currently have to help minimize the disruption. So if, if you know the building well, if you're looking at it from an aerial view, APOD is in the back left corner. If they are working in APOD and the students and kids are traversing over to the addition, which right now is conceptually over near the bus loop, um, it is far, far away. And hopefully the disruption to the day-to-day -day operations would be limited. David and Tom, if you have anything to add. I know we try to minimize through phasing, um, but anything additional would be helpful. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bauer. Um, North Penn School District has renovated seven occupied elementary schools in the past number of years, uh, all of which were occupied, done in phases, and I, I think done very successfully. Um, it is a disruption at times, but we try to minimize that, and especially at the high school, I think the, the ability to minimize it will be a little bit easier because the high school is broken up into large pods. And once the ninth grade addition is constructed, the idea would be to empty a pod, move the students into the new addition, and then renovate the pod. The pods can be isolated very easily from the rest of the building. Uh, I, so I, I won't um, say that there won't be any disruption, but the impact, I believe, will be minimal um, after the addition is built. And the additions are built on the outside of the building um, away from the main uh, structures. They would only have small tie-in locations, probably. And like I said, this, this phasing has not been worked out 100%. We've been talking about it at a 35,000 foot level. But uh, through the design development, we will be talking more about the phasing. Uh, Mr. Schrader, anything to add? <laughs> not to extend it, but uh, all of those points are correct. And you'll notice that both options one and two either had modulars to accommodate the students so that you could vacate the pods, or it had the new construction that allows you to vacate the pods. So for the most part, most of the work will be going on peripherally to the building. When we look at the internal portion for the renovations, the goal for the really invasive work in the central part of the existing building would more be during the summer times. We would try to avoid the school year for the mostly invasive work and kind of steer the construction around that. So that's, that's the only addition I would uh, put on that. Very important addition, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go back to Ms. Lebrowski. Anything else coming into you live? Yeah, there's a lot of questions about a brand new high school, either a second high school or just tearing what we have down and building a new one. Why fix a 50-year-old plus building? So um, if you can maybe address that. Sure, I'll try from my superintendent lens and then uh, kick it to Mr. Schrader. So from my vantage point, building a new high school on our current site would be massively disruptive to our everyday goings on at North Penn High School. If we were okay with, say, no athletics and no extracurricular activities on that campus for four or five years, um, okay, um, maybe we could do that. But Upper Marion had the opportunity and the space to build a new building and then tear down the old. 
Um, in this case, that is not possible. Our site is too compact, and we would not have space for our kids to do the things that they love outside of the classroom. Then you have to talk about, OK, is there somewhere else to go? Or why not two high schools? Um, two high schools, certainly, um, we would still have to fix the current building and acquire the property for a second and build a second. And that is absolutely cost prohibitive. That is, the prices that you're hearing tonight are uh, pale in comparison to what that would be. Certainly something we've looked at. And then finally, the acquisition of a brand new space to go 9, for, nine through 12 elsewhere would be 60 acres plus more um, money to build a brand new structure. So I believe the estimated cost for a brand new high school um, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 450, uh, plus the land acquisition on top of all of that. So really not financially feasible uh, in either case. Mr. Schrader, anything to add? You hit every point, Dr. Bauer. That was easy. Um, the only other things that I would add to that are if you can picture the site plan that you looked at uh, previously, the existing site plan, Take the high school footprint and add about 30 to 40 percent of the square footage to that. Try to figure out how you fit that onto the building with the existing building operating and actually have all of that going on the site at one time. So if you use that in your head as what kind of space we really have, in other words, the building times 1.3 plus the existing building on the site, you can see that this compact site is very, very difficult to do this with. So that's just the visual to add to all the ideas that you brought up, Dr. Bauer. Thank you. Any questions? Yep, Dr. McKenna. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Amy Hawthorne. I have three children in the district, uh, at high school, Pendale Middle School, and Bridal Path Elementary. I have two questions, um, two totally different questions. So one on this site plan, it looks like I'm still seeing the initial entry into the high school and the back exit. Is there any discussion about adding another exit to just make the traffic flow better? But also, it's probably my eyes, but with the elimination of the bus depot in the back, how many additional spaces are you adding? And is there a potential for there to be more than just seniors getting parking spaces? Um, because you've got so many juniors that work or need to get from point A to point B um, from the high school, and there's just not enough. So that's really one question. If you want to answer that, then I can ask another one. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first, well, there's part A and part B of question one, I believe. Uh, part A was an additional entrance. Certainly that would be something in collaboration uh, with the state and the township, whether or not we could. I can tell you that we have explored um, utilizing the entrance to North Monco um, just for staff. So right now we have approximately 400 staff members that work at North Penn High School between teachers and support staff. Um, and we've spoken with them about utilizing their entrance because our start time and their start times are staggered. And they were very supportive of that. So if our staff could come in off of Sumney Town Pike, that's 400 vehicles. Um, that would not be coming in the main entrance or the Snyder Road entrance. Um, in terms of parking in the back, not only would, uh, I don't know who's driving the presentation right now, whether it's you guys or it's Bob, but if you could go to um, one of the two options in advance. Keep going. Almost there. Here we go. Okay, so you notice that parking lot there. Uh, in the back of the building adjacent to Crawford Stadium. So it is more than doubled, and keep in mind the only people who park back there right now are bus drivers. And if we move transportation, those 70 bus drivers are not parking there. Um, so now, it, not only is it more than doubled that parking space, but all the cars are removed too. So yes, our capacity for student drivers and drivers in general on the campus, good thing is ninth graders don't drive. Um, so they're not bringing cars to the property. But there are some staff members that would be coming. Both great questions. Um, so second question is in reference to the referendum. Um, so at the March meeting, you talked about there's four different elections. And I'm just curious why we're pushing for a special election. You mentioned it would be like 70 to 80,000 to make that go through versus I think our 
next election, if you're talking January of 2024, is in May, maybe? So what's the difference, like, what's that extra four months by you, assuming we pass um, that election process, is, is a delay of four months making a huge difference? That's a great question, and that's, that's something in discussion in our presentation with the board that will ultimately need to be decided, you know, those particulars about the referendum. So I did mention in March that the referendum can occur at a municipal election, a general election, a primary election, or a special election. Um, a special election, if that happens, that does buy us several additional months. That would, we are anticipating that to be uh, January of 2024, but you are correct, the primary in 2024, right now in Pennsylvania, is still scheduled to be in May. There's some proposed legislation to move that up to March, I believe, but right now it is May of 2024. So it, it could happen at the primary election in 2024. That is certainly an option to be determined. Okay. Oh, I see some questions down in the front. So this side. All right. He's working his way. We'll get to you. Go ahead, Mr. Nicholson. Oh, Benjamin Hartranfs. How are you guys doing tonight? We're great, Ben. How are you? Good. My question is, are we going to put a sensory room? Oh, actually, I forgot to state my name. Uh, ben Hartranf Ransdale. Are we going to put a sensory room in the high school? Ben, you have my word that if this project goes forward, there would be a sensory room. There was also some of the high schools we went to visit had spaces that were designed specifically for post-12 students. So students who um, would access a, a living space. The one high school we went to see in Falls Church actually had wood floors and actually looked like a home in that area of the building um, to help transition our post-12 students from high school to the real world. So yes and yes, Ben. And it's always great to see you. Uh, Diana Blyce and I have three little kids in the district. Um, how do we reassure the community that, um, like the stadium went from five million to nine million? How do we reassure the community that they're not going to be bearing the weight of that extra increase? Yeah, great question, Mrs. Blystone. Um, probably have to lean on Mr. Schrader again. However, um, it's really about design. It's about when you sit down and have conversations about what you want uh, versus the estimates from the architect. That's on us. That's on um, us as an administration, on our stakeholders, when we sit down with families and kids and staff and see, as Mr. Schrader said to a previous answer, you know, it, we might have to go up, go down. Um, I would assume that the initial estimate when we hear about all the things that everyone wants will be too high. That's how this process works. And then you gradually chip away at it and prioritize. Um, we are, as Mr. Schrader said, we administration are committed to that kind of being at the top of our threshold, and um, we'll have to see what the board is supportive of when the time comes. Anybody over here? I, it it's, was another era ago with Crawford. So, Mr. Scrocky, uh, can you possibly uh, recall some of that budget discussion and, and give us a baseline for the facts uh, about whether that went from five to nine million dollars or not. Yeah, I, I don't have those details at my fingertips right now, but I know some of the bids came in higher than what were estimated. That was a large reason for driving uh, some of the increases. Uh, we did rebid it a second time on the general contractor, uh, but I don't have the specific numbers right in front of me to speak with certainty right now. Yeah. I, I believe that was part of a history of a, a over year long conversation with the community and developing those numbers that we arrived at. So I think that would be helpful based on that uh, good question that we're able to let the community know what variances to expect. Thank you. Okay, I see some, I saw some questions down in the front. He's coming, I promise. <laughs> Hi, my name is Julie Lopes, and I have a second grader at Gwyn Nor, which means that he's definitely going to be one of the kids that benefits from this the most. Um, option one looks amazing. And I had a question about the transportation. I saw that it's about $15 million to move everything. Is there a way, or has it been talked about, um, utilizing the closed-down middle school space for that if um, we end up going with option one? So... We have discussed that. Uh, we have not gone down a path of design. The concern there is, so for example, let's say Pendale eventually came offline. We wouldn't be able to move transportation 
until the end of the project, right? So that would be the last thing to go because Pendale wouldn't be coming offline until ninth graders move into the high school. So that's prohibitive. And then, of course, you have the infrastructure right there, right? It's, it's hard enough to get out of the ESC to make a left, uh, let alone you know, 40 buses or 70 buses if first thing in the morning. So we don't believe the current infrastructure, lights, roads, et cetera, would allow for that. It doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, but it's really about we believe that transportation needs to move first before construction begins, and there wouldn't be a property or space that we currently own for us to put it. Great question. Uh, Jason Lanier, I'm in Lansdale, you guys know me. Um, had actually kind of a comment, kind of a question on a, on a few different things. One is the overall expense. It seemed to be, I'm not going to say it was buried, but it seems not to be completely clear, and I don't know if everybody realizes this is what we're talking about, assuming that you know, if taxes increase, uh, just inflationary taxes, we're going to be close to a billion dollars in debt load over the 30 years. That's just phenomenally high. Um, I don't know if there's really a comment to that other than I don't deny the numbers that Ms. Taraki put forward. There's a lot of research, and I think they're probably spot on for the moment, but they have an idealistic uh, return rate on investment of 2.5%, which offsets a lot of things. And that's, there's a lot of rosy assumptions, let's say. Um, and that aside, I had a couple questions regarding the, the, the transportation center. That seems somewhat separate to the building of the high school, meaning is, are we outgrown the transportation center and that's why we need to move it? Or is it only because we plan on doing this other stuff that we need a transportation center? And why wouldn't that be handled differently? That's sort of one part question. Two part question, $15 million for modular buildings seems excessively high. I, I, just a quick Google search told me that's really high. If you're just renting them for four years, are you renting it for the entire high school, the three pods or the three grades currently? Or is it sort of similarly taking place where you utilize it one at a time for each of the grades. Um, Thank you, Mr. Lanier. So a couple, I think I can hit on all that. First, you, you spoke to the assumptions. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, my, my financial advisor is right next to me, to my right. Um, however, I do believe that our estimates in terms of the modeling, and I know you're not questioning them, I do think they were fairly modest. Um, we, we chose to kind of scale some things back and be very conservative with the financial modeling in terms of projected Act One index. We took the average over the last 16 years since Act One was passed. In terms of um, other inflation, in terms of our overall operational costs, we were very conservative. So I do think our modelings are, are very conservative. Mr. Scrocky, you can speak to that if you'd like. And then in terms of the transportation depot, yes, uh, that is another facility that needs to be updated um, and accessible. We can't even fit a full-scale bus inside of our bays. Um, and that facility is at a point where it needs to be renovated. And in terms of staging and construction and disruption to the campus itself, we believe moving that off the campus, having the space uh, for the construction would be beneficial. Tom or David, do you have anything to add for the transportation depot? And then the modulars, I'm going to pass that one to you, David. Uh, yes, the, the transportation depot, um, you know, the, the, it was built in the, when the high school was built at the same time. Um, we do have ADA accessibility issues there. We do not have the area inside the depot to expand for office. Uh, the office staff has increased over the years. The office is extremely cramped. And also, we don't have any room to increase the uh, number of buses if we needed to. Over the years, the number of transportation vans has dramatically increased, and a lot of those vans are parked in parking lots. They're parked in the, uh, they've been parked at Walton Farm, they've been parked at the high school, and there, we've had a lot of vandalism on them. They can't fit in the yard. So it's really imperative for the bus um, depot to relocate, find a different location. And as Dr. Bauer said, uh, the, the site is very, very tight. Even Today, we are lacking sports fields with the existing athletic teams that we have. So um, it would be imperative to move the transportation off-site. Uh, Mr. Schrader? 
Yeah, we're going to actually throw this back to Mr. Schneider for the, uh, the cost of the modulars in a second here. But very quickly, uh, I think there's a possibility that with option two, you could still keep the transportation center on the site. Um, but all of these things we just talked about, renovating it, trying to get it up to today's standards and so on, probably mean demolition of the existing facility. It's, it's also old, obviously. So where do you build that? while you're building all of the high school uh, work that you're trying to do. And you know that the site is compact as it is. The option one version though, once you add 1,000 students to that site, you need more parking, you need more playing fields. And that is what the transportation center property allows us to do on that site. And so it's almost a necessity as part of that. The estimate for the modulars is an escalated number that uh, Mr. Schneider actually got at one point when there was a conversation about doing some renovations at the high school. So I don't know if you want to expound on that. Uh, yes. Um, regarding the modulars, we, we were looking at um, possibly 24 to 30 modular classrooms. So that, that would be each modular classroom is about 850 to 1,000 square feet. The, it's not only renting the modular classrooms that you have to consider. It's also building the circulation space, the interconnection space. Um, we have to go through land development. We have to go through site development for the modulars. So the, the cost of the modulars is just not renting uh, like a modular trailer that you would use for an office. Uh, going online and checking that price is uh, not accurate at all. Uh, these numbers were um, based upon what we did for Hatfield Elementary School when we renovated Hatfield. And we built um, additional 18 modular classrooms at Penfield. So we took and extrapolated those numbers, uh, general construction costs, elect electrical costs, um, and you know, site costs. So it, it's an estimate. Um, it, uh, we believe that it's a very accurate estimate for the duration. Now, we would need to, uh, for option, Two, we would need to install those modulars before construction starts. Uh, the, the whole modular um, building complex would be constructed. And then we would utilize that space, and those modulars would remain in place until the construction is completed. So it is for the duration of the construction project. That, that's correct. And what we're showing right now could be anywhere from four and a half to six years, depending on uh, how we stage the, and phase the project. So you kind of have to multiply that times that number of years. Okay, questions? All right, over here, and then we'll come to the back. Hi, my name is Crystal McGettigan. I have a daughter in sixth grade, and uh, Northman High School is in my backyard. So I kind of have two vested interests, like really hitting close to home with this. I do have two questions. My first question has my daughter involved. Um, your time frame with the project, first, second, obviously first is more involved. I know that she misses the cutoff for potentially moving to the high school in ninth grade. She misses it probably by a year. Does she still have the opportunity to possibly take advantage of some of the new construction to the main building during her time there? Because she's slated to graduate in 2029, or is it just going to be she's kind of bouncing back and forth throughout her high school experience. Do you want to ask the second question and then we'll tackle both? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the second question I was wondering, as you guys are gonna be doing construction on a building that started, to, that was built in 1950s, 1970s, obviously there could be asbestos, other harmful things that are in there that you're gonna be disrupting. Will there be things in place to keep the students and surrounding community safe during construction? Great, great questions. Okay, so the first one, uh, you are correct that your sixth grader will not be able to take advantage of going there because ninth grade will be last if this passes and if we move forward. Um, we said we would use that as a swing space. So ninth graders coming up would be the last step. So that will not be done in the next three years. Um, but the first thing done will be that that space is built and utilized to help us renovate the rest of the building. So I'm very confident in saying that your sixth grader would access those new aspects of the building. Not all of them, of course, because there would be new spaces as a result of the renovation, but certainly the addition, yes. Um, and then for the next question, I guess we have to pass the asbestos abatement, et cetera. Uh, your question's very good, and uh, I understand the question. And every 
project that we've done in North Penn School District since probably 2005 has had some form of asbestos abatement. Um, it is normal during the construction phase. We hire an environmental consultant to come in to design specified specifications um, for the abatement. We hire air monitoring services. And those areas are cordoned off and held in negative pressure so that nothing escapes. And there, there's actually requirements by the EPA that we have to follow. And we have to submit to the EPA when this work is performed, and the EPA actually can come out and inspect. So um, there are safeguards throughout. And that, that also includes with uh, if we have underground storage tanks, we have potential of um, lead paint, things like that. So every bit of hazardous materials will be investigated, and then it will be taken care of through construction. If I might add, thank you, uh, Mr. Schneider. It, what the community also can, can learn from our experience at NAP, that was a 1955 uh, core that was renovated. And it was amazing uh, being on the Facilities and Operations Committee, which meets every month, you'll actually get those updates and understand throughout this process every month uh, when you know, there are additional um, uh, unknowns that are found that will affect the environment. And you also will learn, I think the, the administration has done a very good job at sharing exactly what those plans are. And at NAP, we had quite a few things come up. I remember we had the you know, Department of Environmental uh, Protection come out because there's one of those tanks underground. And it's amazing the, the level of scrutiny and re the resources that are put in place to ensure that, that the community, the students, and the staff are safe throughout that. And the, this uh, board has been committed through um, Ms. Wesley's leadership of the Facilities and Operations Committee to be extremely transparent, and I would expect that very same process going forward for the high school. Thank you. Okay, I know there's one in the back that Dr. McKenna is going to um, get asked, and then we're going to jump to okay. Ms. Liberoski, who has a few more things coming in online. And then if there's anybody else who continues to have questions or any remaining questions that are lingering, you are welcome to come up because we are going to wrap up and do our last slide, with this, which we'll talk about next step. So Dr. McKenna and then Ms. Liberoski. Hi, I'm Erica McCarran from Lansdale. My question is with either one of the options that were proposed, is there still gonna be an open outdoor space like the courtyard that is at the high school now? Um, I feel the kids utilize that space, especially on a day like today and even tomorrow. Or you still have that as an option um, in the proposed, one of the two proposed plans? Uh, great question, Erica, thank you. And yes, yes, um, I'm hopeful that we would expand upon the outdoor options. Uh, not only have outdoor options and better utilize what we call the AEF courtyard there in the middle, but also create new opportunities in outdoor classroom spaces. So not just space, but actually classroom space. Some of the schools we went to see had an amphitheater uh, for performances, kind of like an auditorium outside. Love to see a structure like that. But yes, um, a lot of the research, and we kind of articulated some of that, is uh, kids need to be outside. They need the natural air. They need the natural light. Uh, for mental health and even academic performance. So absolutely, um, I think it's a travesty that we don't better utilize that space as is. That space you're talking about outside reminded me of like SeaWorld. All they were missing were dolphins. It was really cool. Anyway, Miss Liberoski, <laughs> and then we're going to wrap up. <laughs> yes. How do I follow that? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to try to tie together two different questions, and uh, generally, there people are asking, "What is the overall strategy for the buildings in our in our district for for the schools?" So we're talking a lot about the high school, but what about our middle schools? What about our aging elementary schools? What about air conditioning? And then, kind of tied to that, have we looked at um, an en enrollment, and uh, it, does our plan meet what we might have found in any enrollment study? Yeah, great questions. Again, good job, everybody online. Um, so the first question is in terms of like master planning. And the answer to that is, I wish we had air conditioning and renovated middle schools 20 years ago. Um, but the infrastructure of these buildings, this being one of them, versus the high school is not close. Um, the high school is in far more desperate need of renovation than our middle schools. Um, unfortunately, adding Air conditioning in a middle school is not as simple as, let's say, 80 wall units or 80 window units. 
it's upgrades to the systems in general, the electrical capacity um, and the systems overall. So that would take essentially a large scale renovation to tear everything out and install air conditioning and the price tag is estimated for the three buildings to be somewhere around 60, I believe at this part, at this point with escalation. Um, so $60 million just to add air conditioning and then Brook and Field, this is Pembroke, have significant number of modulars um, and modular construction, which we want to remove, the temporary construction, and actually build the building um, and expand. So we are prioritizing the high school. Um, not only does the infrastructure need it, but it doesn't make sense to put that kind of money into our middle schools to just then potentially tear it out to renovate. Um, so that's why the high school is going first. We absolutely, the middle schools will be next, but we can't decide what will happen with those middle schools until we decide what is going to happen with ninth grade. In terms of enrollment in general, there is definitely a sense in some of the questions we've been receiving submitted uh, about the, the booming population growth in the North Penn School District. Believe it or not, our, pop, our student population, and just because they are building houses and expanding in the community doesn't mean that's more school-aged kids. But our population has been stable for well over 20 years. Um, our projection is an additional 150 students over the next five. We did a enrollment study with the Montgomery County Planning Commission um, just recently. We did recognize, and if you want to watch that, I believe that was the January work session uh, where we presented that study. They projected over 10 years it to be significant, but we also pointed to the volatility of that data. Um, so not only did we add full day kindergarten, so we had a dramatic increase in our data when we added full day kindergarten. Um, a couple hundred students joined the district at that time, but then we had COVID-19 and the pandemic, and we had a lot of students leave uh, during that time, but then they then in turn came back. Um, so the data has been very volatile, and in terms of forecasting and for projecting, um, I just don't know that we have confidence in um, th that we shouldn't do another study in the near future. Um, I believe that the study is accurate. They did a great job with the numbers, but the numbers that they were using were so volatile um, that we are committed to doing another enrollment study in two or three years. But as of right now, they're saying 150 additional students over the next five years. Um, you can take that and divide it among 18 schools, and that's really not a significant number. So great questions. Okay, I oh, realized, hold on, hold on, I'm so more. sorry. Ms. Wesley, go ahead. Hi, I just want to add on to the first question regarding the existing structures. As Dr. Bauer mentioned, um, air conditioning is on the list, but there are 21 buildings in our district, and with um, Mr. Schneider leading the way, we have a 10-year capital project plan, and that capital project plan looks at all of the existing assets, the elementary schools, the other middle schools, um, the ESC, and it's been prioritized in terms of different metrics to see what we need to do. So while we are working on whichever option we move forward with, we also will be looking to maintain our existing assets. And I think that's important for, for us to note. And I think that's a priority for us as we move forward. Thank you for adding that, yeah, thank Mr. You. Casa. Yeah. And I just want to add, for, for the, because I believe that came from on, online or social media, but that's also public facing. So whomever reached out or anyone in the public, that, that, that information is shared. Once again, something that is regular, regularly reviewed and updated through the facilities and operations monthly committees. Yeah, great addition there, Mr. Casa. And I think Mr. Scrocky said, we plan to have North Penn High School renovations and this process as a standing agenda item on the Facilities and Operations Committee moving forward. I'm sure it will be discussed in finance as well, uh, time and time again. And the committee structure is where things are a little bit more granular. So great. All right, Dr. Waters, okay. wrap us we up. Actually, all right, I am going to wrap us up, but we do have one question over here that I saw earlier and forgot. So we're going to go here, and then if we could cue the next slide and get ready to wrap up, we'll do that right after. Th thanks for squeezing me, and I appreciate it. I could just add just a real quick levity to it. Um, I was 15 minutes late tonight. Vince Altieri, Lansdale, Pennsylvania. My daughter goes to Pendell Middle School. Unfortunately, they had a softball game tonight. The umpire didn't show up. I'm a fool. I volunteered to umpire. Unfortunately, Pendell lost, but thankfully I didn't have to call my daughter out on strikes. Thank God. So any, in, any, in any event, you know, I'm trying to keep an open mind, or I am keeping an open mind um, to listening to everything that's going on. It's great that we're having this conversation. 
And I would just, I'm curious, is there anyone on the current board of directors, um, either in the audience or, or up, up, up on the board there, that has a compelling reason not to move forward? Because I've heard a lot of reasons for moving. I'm curious if anyone has any particular reason why they would not, short of a concern, because I think we're all concerned, but as a taxpayer and as a parent, that would be my question for the board. And then I just had real two other quick points. I mean, I <clears throat> can only speak for myself here, although I do think it's a shared sentiment that I mean, this is a project that, that you know this board has been discussing with the public um, for at least four years now. I know I wrote a board letter about the ninth grade center pre-COVID. Um, when I ran for the school board, uh, one of the things many constituents wanted to talk about was a second high school, um, which I grew up in Horsham, so I kind of remember when that was a thing out here. Um, I think the community recognizes that the building itself is not reflective of the education that we provide students in this district, and it's not just that it's it doesn't look good. It's that it limits the ability of what we can do with and for our students. The students seem to understand that. Uh, the conversations that I've had over the years with um, the staff certainly have informed my understanding of what those limitations are. Uh, my ongoing communications with the community uh, you know, have continually uh, emphasized this need to do something about the building, right? So the question really becomes about the scope, right? What is the scope of the project? Where do we want to go? And, and that may be where you would see some difference um, in opinion with the board uh, to what, you know, what the scope is. But um, to do something, to do nothing, as we've said, is not an option. It's absolutely not an option to just continue to let that building decay. We owe it to the children in this community to do better than, than to just yeah, allow it to yeah. fall apart. So, so, so can I add? Sure. Because, because I have a lot of passion about this. I personally also believe that we need to do option one. Um, I've learned a lot about the educational benefits of the ninth grade center. But when you look at the high school and the uh, infrastructure problems, there's no redundancy. There are failures often. You have a great maintenance team that is able to uh, facilitate and keep the school running and classes going. But a lot of the equipment is outdated. Uh, they're making parts. It doesn't, the parts don't exist anymore. The other piece is, and this is where I get my engineering head on is, is that you have points of failure. If we continue with the building as is, the whole, and I'm not trying to sound dramatic, the entire school is a major point of failure. There could be something that happens that would cause us to not be able to move students to a different location. So from an infrastructure perspective, we're there. We're at the high level alarm is up and it is a required response. Okay, we're really quick. Okay. So again, yeah, I will be quick. So it really flowed right into my next comments last question is I would like to see some research on neighboring schools, older their, how old their buildings are, and what their school rankings are compared to what North Penn School District's rankings are. And then the last, the last point that I'd like to make is back to the referendum. I don't know if you have time to put it back up. I'm pretty sure the number was about $100 million, Mr. Skoraki. Um, you know, as, as just a person that, I'm not a politician, uh, and I'm just a person of common sense, it just doesn't make sense to me why we would put up something that says 100 million. And I know you explained the reasons when in essence the number will be a lot closer to a billion dollars. I just don't think that's a fair way to approach the community. I don't think it's being transparent. And thanks for the, let me have the additional points. You're welcome. All right, so I think we can circle back with that um, a little bit later. Um, and we are gonna now go to the next slide which talks about next steps before we uh, conclude this evening's program. Okay, I lost my uh, feedback monitor over here. So uh, there is a website linked to all things uh, North Penn High School Reimagined that is linked in this presentation, but it's also linked on our main webpage, npenn.org. Um, you are welcome to request a behind the scenes tour. Uh, we have a team of folks equipped and prepared to walk you through the facility at any time. 
Um, we have resources to share. Kind of, we can take you and see boiler rooms and systems and what we have versus what we could or what newer spaces look like. And then, of course, we will continue to add to the frequently asked questions on that website. So continue filling out that form and asking us questions. But more immediately, uh, we are here. Come on up. Come ask questions. Send emails. I, I do pride our team here on being very accessible. Send me an email. I will get back to you 100% of the time. Um, so thank you. Regardless of where you are on this matter or this issue, you're here tonight because you care. And I appreciate that. Uh, it's really important for our children and our staff and our community at large. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Get home safely. Mm -hmm.